Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's garage, we're talking about VLANs and why you should likely have one. So what is a VLAN and why do you care? Well, it all depends on what you have running on your network, like if you have any Internet of Things devices on your home network. For example, if you have any cameras, doorbells, light bulbs, thermostats, or refrigerators on your home Wi-Fi, then you definitely need to know about VLANs. VLAN stands for Virtual Local Area Network, and it is a concept used in computer networking that allows for the creation of virtual networks within your physical networks. Imagine your house was wired with two completely different networks and that it used colored cables, red or blue, each on its own, and the switches never connected each other. A VLAN is a little bit like that. In the case of a virtual LAN, however, they share the same cabling while actually being different networks. It enables network administrators to partition a single physical network into multiple distinct logical networks. Now, each VLAN functions as a separate network with its own resources and traffic, but they all share the same physical infrastructure, i.e. the cabling and the switches. Perhaps it's best to think about it as pipes within pipes. Imagine your LAN is the big white outer pipe, and within your big white LAN pipe are some smaller pipes in red, blue, and green that run inside your outer pipe. The packets on each network can't leave their small pipe, so the small colored pipes within are like a network within a network. Let's call the red pipe the red VLAN. Anyone connected to the red VLAN can see all traffic for everyone else on the red VLAN, but they can't see traffic on other devices or the other colored pipes, and depending on how the rules are set up, even within the big white pipe itself. And similarly, we have a blue pipe for a blue VLAN and a green VLAN as well. And because the clients connected to the red VLAN can't see into the other colored pipes, our network is now effectively partitioned into the main LAN plus three new VLANs. They all connect back to the router, which is where they were created, and each has access to the internet through that connection. Let's call the big white pipe our LAN, which is where our general untagged home traffic goes, and then each isolated VLAN will have a tag or an ID associated with it, like red, green, or blue. Let's make the red one the danger zone. That's where we'll put all of our cameras from offshore vendors, doorbells that record to the cloud, and dishwashers that inexplicably need to access a central web server in order to clean your plates. But these devices have no reason and indeed usually no business even looking at our Windows PCs or MacBooks. They need connectivity to the internet and to the cloud, but not to our other home LAN clients around our house. Perhaps we make the green zone a VLAN that's safe for kids with different content, time, and bandwidth restrictions. By dividing a large network into smaller isolated segments, VLANs reduce the amount of broadcast traffic, which can significantly improve network performance. This isolation also enhances network security, as it limits the spread of broadcast storms and contains network problems within a single VLAN, preventing them from affecting the performance of the entire network. A broadcast on the blue VLAN only reaches the blue clients, and it doesn't bother the rest of the network. Another important purpose of VLANs is network segmentation. This feature allows for better control over traffic, as administrators can group together users' devices with similar needs or roles. For example, a company might have separate VLANs for its accounting department, its HR department, and guest Wi-Fi, ensuring that sensitive data is only accessible to authorized users. This segmentation also simplifies network management and troubleshooting as problems can be isolated and resolved within a specific VLAN. Now, how do VLANs work? Well, VLANs operate way down at the data link layer, which is layer two of the OSI network model. They work by stamping or tagging network frames with a VLAN identifier or ID as they pass through a network switch or router. Earlier, we used the colors red, green, and blue, but it's normally just an integer ID. So one, two, and three. This ID designates the frame to be a specific VLAN. When a device sends out a data frame, the network switch adds the VLAN ID to that frame, and when it receives the frame, it reads the VLAN ID and forwards it to the appropriate VLAN. This tagging process ensures that data is only shared between devices on the same VLAN, even though they might be physically connected to the same switch. It's like having multiple separate networks running on the same physical infrastructure. The switch uses these tags to segregate and manage traffic, ensuring that data intended for one VLAN never ends up on another. This separation is crucial for maintaining the security and efficiency of the network. To put it more simply, if two frames come into a switch and have different VLAN tags, it's like those frames are on completely different disconnected networks. One of the major benefits of VLANs is enhanced network security. By segregating different parts of a network, VLANs can limit access to sensitive information, reducing the risk of data breaches. 
For example, a VLAN in your home business can be set up to restrict access to only those authorized to view sensitive financial or customer information. This isolation also helps in containing network problems. If a security breach or network issue occurs, it is again confined to that particular VLAN and doesn't affect the entire network. We achieved this level of isolation in our earlier example by placing all of our IoT traffic into the red zone. And we could anoint the blue zone as the business zone and the green zone as the kids network, whatever makes the most sense to you. VLANs also contribute to improved network performance by, as we said earlier, preventing broadcast storms from propagating across VLANs. Additionally, VLANs provide better network management and flexibility. Network administrators can easily add or modify VLANs without changing any cabling or anything about the physical setup, allowing for quick adjustments to network structures as organizational needs change. In reality, this isn't likely to be a major factor within a home or a small lab, but it can be a big deal on larger corporate networks. VLAN tagging is a crucial concept in the operation of VLANs, and it's defined by the 802.1Q standard. This standard defines a mechanism and an approach for inserting a VLAN tag into Ethernet frames. The tag, which is part of the frame header, includes the information about which VLAN the frame belongs to. This tagging allows VLANs to coexist on the single physical network and is essential for directing traffic to the correct VLAN. So the VLAN tag includes a unique identifier for each VLAN, ensuring that data is kept separate and secure as it travels through the shared equipment. When a tagged frame reaches a switch, the switch reads the VLAN ID and then forwards the frame to the appropriate port that belongs to that VLAN. This tagging mechanism is transparent to the users and devices on the network, enabling seamless communication within each VLAN while maintaining the segregation of data between the different VLANs. And by the way, the VLAN tag is a fundamental part of Ethernet networking, not something that was added later, but it's not something like NAT that shields you from the network. And you can actually find it right next to the MAC address in the Ethernet frame. It's 12 bits wide, which means you could have 4,096 different VLANs operating on the same physical LAN. But when you plug into a network jack or connect to the Wi-Fi, how do you know which VLAN you'll wind up in? Well, that's defined by the router, where you can specifically map which physical ports or jacks provide access to which VLAN. So if you had a 16-port router, you could have three jacks for one VLAN, five jacks for another VLAN, and eight jacks for another VLAN. Similarly, the Wi-Fi router controls which VLAN the connection is assigned to based on rules you set in its configuration, as we'll see later. Take my advice and put some kind of color coding on the ports, and better yet, use colored cables to help you keep your VLAN separate. Various types of VLANs cater to different networking needs. Port-based VLANs are common where VLAN membership is determined by the physical port on the switch. Devices connected to that specific port automatically belong to the VLAN assigned to that port. Another type is the protocol-based VLAN, where VLAN membership is based on the protocol being used by the client. This allows for more dynamic and flexible network segmentation. Perhaps the most common scenario for home use is to place all Wi-Fi traffic from a particular SSID onto its own VLAN so that traffic can be managed centrally. Done properly, everyone on the guest Wi-Fi should also be in their own VLAN, but more about that later. Tag-based VLANs use VLAN tags, like the 802.1Q standard, to determine VLAN membership. And this approach is more flexible and scalable, especially in larger networks with dynamic requirements. Voice VLANs are designed specifically for voice over IP traffic, ensuring quality of service by prioritizing voice traffic over all other types. But that's prioritizing that entire VLAN, so you don't have to go through and tweak packets. And second of all, there's no need for the phone system to be able to see your file server, right? So this is a great example of why and where segmentation can help. Understanding these types of needs helps in designing a network infrastructure that best suits the organizational needs and ensures optimal performance. Configuring VLANs involves several steps, starting with defining VLANs on the network switches. Each VLAN is assigned a unique identifier and network ports are configured to belong to specific VLANs. This process can be done manually or through automated network management tools, depending on the size and complexity of the network. The configuration includes assigning those specific ports to the VLANs in the case of the port-based VLANs or in setting up rules for tagging in the case of different VLANs for different SSIDs. Remember, with VLANs enabled, every one of the network frames that comes over the cable or the Wi-Fi will include the VLAN in the Ethernet frame. Each piece of equipment that deals with networking from switches to routers to desktops needs to understand the VLAN ID and if they don't, to ignore the frame. The configuration process also involves setting up VLAN routing if inter-VLAN communication is needed. This usually requires a Layer 3 switch or a router capable of understanding VLAN tags. 
The router or switch is configured with the sub-interfaces for each VLAN, defining how the traffic is routed between them. This step is crucial for maintaining network segmentation while allowing the necessary communication between VLANs that you might need. Let's have a look at how I go about setting it up on my Ubiquiti hardware. Of course, it will vary depending on who makes your router, but the general process and ideas should still carry over. Okay, once inside the UI for my Ubiquiti router, which is a unified Dream Machine Pro, not sponsored by the way, just a happy user of their equipment, we'll go in and check the settings for the entire network, which is where we'll find our VLAN setup. So I'll click on the gear icon here, and we'll click on the Networks tab. I will click on New Virtual Network to create a new VLAN, and we have to give it a friendly name, so I will call it Not Porn. That's very descriptive of what we're going to have on here, so that should work. I'm going to go in and put in my own host address of 10.0.0.1 to show you that it can be an entirely separate subnet. And when I click Add, you'll see it now listed there in the top three, along with my Homeland, the Internet of Things VLAN, and the Not Porn VLAN. Next, we'll have a look at my routing rules. The first one here blocks access from the IoT from reaching the Plumber LAN network. That way, nothing from the IoT network is able to see, access, disturb, or inspect, or in any way reach anything that's connected to the normal LAN. In the fine print, you can see I have 106 devices on the main LAN and then 42 devices on the IoT LAN, which goes to show that there's a significant number of devices that I did want to partition off. And the other rule we want to look at is to allow me to ping things that are on the IoT network to check that they're alive. They can't see me, but I can see them, and only through the ICMP port. So I allow just that small bit of traffic through in order to be able to verify that things are alive and working. Routing between VLANs is necessary when devices on different VLANs need to communicate with each other. Since VLANs are typically isolated way down at layer 2, a layer 3 device, like a router or multi-layer switch, is then needed to facilitate this communication. This process is known as inter-VLAN routing. The router examines the source and destination IP addresses of packets and then routes them to the appropriate VLAN, maintaining the segregation of the VLANs while allowing necessary data exchange. For efficient routing between VLANs, it's crucial to have a well-thought-out network design. This includes planning the IP addressing scheme and ensuring proper configuration of routing protocols if needed. Subnetting may also be used to optimize the routing process. Properly configured VLAN routing enhances network security and performance by ensuring that traffic is directed only where it is needed and authorized. It's important to remember that because the VLANs really are treated as independent networks, each will have its own DHCP server and range as well. Your main LAN might be 192.168.1.1 and your first VLAN could be 10.0.0.1. Unless traffic is then specifically routed between the two based on rules created at your router, no traffic will ever flow between them. In my own home lab setup, I want to be able to see the red IoT network from the LAN, but not vice versa. Thus, I have two rules. One to block all traffic coming from the red and going to white, and then one to specifically exempt and allow ICMP ping requests. That way I can still ping machines on the VLAN, just to check if they're up, but those devices can't reach me back. VLANs find use in a variety of scenarios. In the corporate networks, they are used to segment different networks or departments or teams, and in large-scale data centers and cloud environments, VLANs are used to segregate customer data and manage services efficiently. They also play a crucial role in public Wi-Fi networks, such as in hotels or airports where a separate VLAN might be used for guest access to ensure the security of the primary network. These examples illustrate the versatility and importance of VLANs in various network environments, showcasing their ability to enhance security, performance, and manageability. In smaller deployments like your home LAN, VLANs can still play an important role even if you have a very simple setup. Let's assume for now that you're not just giving every visitor that comes to your house your Wi-Fi credentials, at least I hope you're not doing that, and that you have at least set up a guest network. Your guests just want internet access through your Wi-Fi, and they don't need access to your desktop, so don't give them that access. If you have kids in the house, you might also set up a separate Wi-Fi VLAN that offers some protection from the darker sides of the web. Maybe you don't support Tor in the green zone, for example. Similarly, you could and should create a separate Wi-Fi SSID for the kids' VLAN, and any guests that join it will be automatically restricted to that VLAN. So the SSID and the password that the kids get automatically binds them to that particularly safe VLAN. But a common misconception about VLANs is that they completely secure the network. While VLANs enhance security by segmenting, as we've said several times, they are not a standalone security measure that solves everything all on their own. 
Additional security measures, such as firewalls, access control lists, intrusion prevention systems, and so on, are all necessary to still fully secure the network. It's important to understand that VLANs are part of a larger network security strategy. Another misconception is that VLANs specifically complicate network management. While they do add a layer of complexity, the benefits of improved performance and security often outweigh it. With proper planning and management tools, VLANs can be relatively straightforward to manage. Additionally, some believe VLANs can cause a significant performance overhead due to the tagging and untagging process. However, modern network hardware is more than capable of handling 4 bytes. When implementing VLANs, one of the best practices is careful planning and documentation. A clear understanding of the network layout, the user requirements, and the security policies in advance is essential. And this planning should include a map of which ports are assigned to which VLANs and how inter-VLAN routing is handled. Proper documentation ensures that the network can be easily managed and modified as needed. And I'm still talking about home, too. And it doesn't have to be fancy, but I do strongly encourage you to write it down in your spiral notebook, tear out the page, and tape it to your router if you need. I'm not saying that's secure, but it's better than trying to remember what the heck you did 18 months from now. VLANs should be part of a layered security approach. They're an important part of the solution, but just a part. Troubleshooting VLAN issues can be challenging due to the added complexity of the network segmentation. A common issue is incorrect VLAN configurations, which can lead to connectivity problems. Ensure that all switch ports are correctly assigned to the intended VLANs and that the tagging configurations are consistent across the entire network. Checking the VLAN assignment configuration on each switch port is a critical step in such troubleshooting. Another common problem is having issues with inner VLAN routing. You'll need to ensure that the Layer 3 devices, the routers or the Layer 3 switches, are correctly configured for routing between the VLANs. This includes verifying the correct setup of IP addresses, subnet masks, and routing protocols. And additionally, keeping firmware and software updated on network devices can prevent many issues related to VLANs. Because sometimes the advanced features are the last ones to fully get debugged, so it's worth staying up to date in this case. If you found today's VLAN episode to be interesting or entertaining, you might want to check out my episode on virtualization, which I've linked in the video description. I'd also appreciate it if you'd consider subscribing to the channel. I'm not selling anything, and I don't have any Patreons, I'm just in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.